but I've been doing this stuff for a long time and this is a weird year and I'm not sure it's going to go away. And certainly when we do your COVID vaccines, this may be still going to be something that you need to do. And it has to do with the enhanced screening that you're having to do now due to COVID before somebody comes in to get a vaccine. So if somebody comes in your pharmacy and wants a vaccine, and this first slide just says, it's been recognized. It's super important that patients still have access to their normal routine vaccines and including childhood vaccines all the way down to three years of age they've talked about. So they want people coming to the pharmacy to have access to this immunization service, all right? Well, how do you protect yourself and the patients around you to make sure you're not exposed to COVID if there's some way you can screen and prevent those patients from coming into your immunization area? So the idea is this screening has to occur prior to, you don't wanna do it in your vaccination area, you don't wanna do it right in the pharmacy, but before they get to the pharmacy, we want to stop them and we want to screen them. And the take-home message is, you're gonna screen them for symptoms and you're gonna screen them for fever and see if they're a febrile or not. And on top of that, then you're gonna to have to wear some additional PPE or personal protective equipment I'm talking about, okay? So remember, this is something you're gonna do. You're gonna to wanna to set up a sort of table or somewhere to be able to stop people after they come into the building, but you don't wanna block fire exits. You don't wanna block the main door. You need them to be able to, as they're coming to wherever they need to be by the pharmacy, stop them early and screen them and ask them questions and to be able to take their temperature to see if they can go further on and go ahead and get their vaccine. So what do you need to do as a screener? If you're, if you're setting up the screeners or as an intern, you're stuck as the screener individual, the minimum you have to have is a mask. You have to have your face mask. You also need to set it up so the patient stays six feet away from you while you're doing the screening. So you wanna have tapes, uh, tape down and a table kind of a barrier, keep them back six feet. And then you're gonna ask them some questions and you're gonna take them their temperature. You're gonna then need some gloves. You're gonna to wanna to have gloves to avoid the touch contact and then some sanitizing wipes and things to be able to clean your equipment, your pens and papers, maybe your uh, clipboards, whatever you're using for that. So this is just another picture that kind of does a good job of showing this. And this was a, a big thing that had to be developed on the fly by most institutions on in March and, and April, okay? So it just kind of reminds you some of the things I said. What's interesting is now you kind of, well, let's go through from the beginning. So we've got their table, we've got our equipment, we've got our thermometer there, we've got, we're out of the main flow of traffic there. We've got six feet away from us. We're wearing a face mask. Patient comes in, says, I want to get my flu shot. So what is the first thing you're going to do? is look to make sure that they're wearing a face mask. So again, everyone coming to the pharmacy has to wear a face mask. And this has gotten better, but there are still some patients who are resistant to wearing a face mask. So if they have a face mask, that's great. You're gonna go on to the questions and temperature and then vaccine. If they're not wearing a face mask, you hand them a face mask. If they put the face mask on, then you ask them the questions, take their temperature, send them to the vaccine. If they won't do the mask, if they say, no, no, I'm not gonna wear a mask. It's my right not to have to wear a mask then you need to politely respond to them, but it'd be emphatic and therefore we cannot provide you this vaccine service. And always blame the policy, blame somebody who's not right there in the store, but regardless, you're not allowed to be able to provide them a vaccine. Something, I don't like this little, uh, this thing at the very bottom of the slide says, I'm sorry, but our policy requires that our patients wear a face mask. When providing vaccinations, we are unable to maintain social or practice social distancing. Requiring masks helps ensure the safety of our patients and the staff. If you aren't comfortable wearing a mask today, then we won't be able to provide you a vaccination for you today. I mean, be firm about that and just realize nobody who is not willing to wear a mask can come into the pharmacy and receive a vaccination. But most of them, they're masked, right? So, okay, they got their mask or you give them a mask, they put it on, they sanitize their hands. You're going to ask them some questions. Remember, part two was ask questions. You know these questions, they're in the CV key app, so you probably answer them every day you come into the building here. But just as a reminder, if they come positive, the questions are usually asked, so if they ever say yes, that's going to be a uh, rejection. So that's going to say, okay, well, I'm sorry, we won't be able to provide you services today. Please consider coming back in two weeks or 14 days, and we should hopefully at that time be able to provide you the vaccine. So a yes is a screen failure, and they're going to be rejected for today. If they say no, then you move on to the next question. So have you been denied in the past 14 days? No. Then this is an important one. And it's the same thing with the CV key. It asks you for a bunch of symptoms. So I won't re repeat those symptoms. So you can see them listed there. I will tell you what we have found out since this first started in March and April is there's a wide variety of symptoms and fever, what I'm gonna talk about here in a little bit for temperature is not as common as we thought it was going to be. There are many asymptomatic carriers 
that uh, don't have fever. So, uh, or even symptomatic people that get more of the GI symptoms than the fever. So there is a wide variety. So that's why there's quite a list of those. So you kind of list those off and see if the patient uh, confirms if they've had any of those symptoms in the last 14 days. If they haven't, then they're good to go on to the next question. Next question talks about the COVID test. Have you had a positive test within the 14 days? And then lastly, have you been in direct contact with somebody who has tested positive within the last 14 days? I know you know all this stuff, but any of those you would be yes, then the answer is okay, well, that's fine. But unfortunately, we're gonna need you to come back and get your vaccine in about two weeks, all right? But if they say no to all of those questions, then all the screening's done. The last thing, and I'm not, is to take their temperature. And I'll still say, this has been found out to be the least reliable thing to do. The temperature testing has not really been a, a big source of catching people with this, but it's still some institutions require it. So make sure we understand. So what is a normal temperature? 98.6, plus or minus, there's variations on that. So that's normal. What's considered a fever? What was the cutoff for a lot of the screenings was 100 degrees Celsius, uh, not Celsius, God forbid, Fahrenheit. Uh, so it varied a little bit, but usually about 100 degrees. If you were more than 100 degrees, that would be considered a screening failure. We'd ask for them to come back in 14 days and hopefully their temperature would be back to normal, all right? Well, but you don't wanna go over there and stick a thermometer in their mouth. You, that's gross and you're too close. And so how can we do it? Well, you're gonna use these kind of gun-shaped looking thermometers called a non-contact infrared thermometer, an NCIT. You look at this picture here, this is the kind of picture that just I uh, always remember for 2020. 2020 is the picture of somebody holding these thermometer looking guns, and especially some of the younger children as they're going back to school and the whole bit, this, it's just, it's iconic view of trying to protect and screen people out so using by taking their temperature. These thermometers, while they're kind of bad looking in the sense of looking like a gun, they work well. There's no contact, so you don't have to sanitize after each individual patient. You clean it in the morning, you clean it at the end of the shift, just make sure you don't touch it to anybody. And then, but the biggest thing, and they're pretty straightforward to use, and I'll talk about it, the biggest problem has been is their accuracy. And even if you do it right, if somebody was wearing a ball cap or a, a, a bandana or some sort of hood thing, then it's going to keep the body heat around their head. So when you took their temperature, their values were artificially high. If they'd been outside or sweaty and they wipe it or wipe it with any sort of like alcohol containing thing for makeup stuff, that tends to cool the skin. So there are lots of ways that they, these values were being thrown off not the least of which was just terrible technique. You have to use them correctly if you're gonna get a good value. And the biggest thing is most of them have to be dead on, straight perpendicular, not at an angle, not way over here somewhere, straight on and no more than one or two inches. I mean, this is like feet over here. So again, where you had to be that close. So a lot of times there were examples and look at some of the pictures you can see of people doing these screenings where the thermometer was way too far away. Therefore the values read low. So it doesn't look like they have a fever and they were passed on. Uh, you can see some of the pictures here, angle is a problem. I like the picture on the bottom because the person giving the test is doing it just right, straight on within an inch or two, but the lady's face is outdoors right in the sunlight. So that sunlight is gonna be reflecting off her face and elevating the value that it's gonna give. It could give a false positive. So temperatures are probably, this whole thermometer the temperature testing is the least accurate way of screening a patient. The questions are probably much more important. You may or may not be doing temperatures anymore. I'm not sure because people have kind of frowned on their accuracy. Regardless at this point, we assume they, they answered no to all the questions. You did the thermometer test and they are not having a fever. Good, you pass them along and send them into the vaccination area where then you're gonna give them the sheets for the screening forms and start the whole regular process there, okay? Well, that's, I just realized that's kind of a new step that's done before people just walk up to the counter and say, I want my flu shot, All right? Now, the other thing that's new in terms of just giving vaccines is the additional PPE requirement, personal protective equipment. So this summarizes here, a pharmacist giving the vaccine, you have to wear a face mask, you're gonna have to wear a face shield, and you're gonna be wearing gloves, all right? So that brings up for the injection technique labs for the next two weeks. Make sure you bring your face mask, you have to wear your face mask, I will be providing you a, a plastic face shield. So I will be giving you the shield to use. Don't lose it. You got to bring it back next spring when we do blood pressures. But we will be giving you a plastic face shield as well. And I will also give you gloves. You'll be wearing gloves. So these three things are the things you're going to gown up with to be able to safely administer vaccines to somebody during the age of COVID. Believe it or not, there's kind of a right or wrong way to put these things on. The first thing you're going to want to do before you do anything is wash your hands. Soap and water. Warm water and soap is the best way. If you're in a place where there isn't a sink available, then you can use hand sanitizer. So either way you wash or sanitize your hands, 
Okay, once your hands are clean, then you're going to attach the mask. So you put on the mask, then you put on the face shield. So mask, shield, and then gloves. So gloves are actually the last thing that you put on. Believe it or not, there's an important way to remove all of that. And it goes in the opposite order. So the first thing you actually do is remove and dispose of the gloves. Then you carefully take off the face shield. Then you remove the mask and then you sanitize your hands. And again, it's important to do the hands at the very end because as this manipulation, you might have come into contact with some of the virus. So again, you put it on with gloves, mask, face shield, glo well, no, no, wash hands, then your mask, your face shield, then your gloves. And when you remove it, it's gloves off, shield off, mask off, wash your hands. So kind of going in opposite directions there. This slide that you have access to gives you more detail than I'll go through, but there is a whole system of washing your hands and getting all of it done and all of the stuff. So there's quite a, a way to be able to truly sanitize your hand carefully. Some mask things, I know you know this, <laughs> you've been wearing masks forever, but as it comes to using those uh, cloth, not cloth masks, but the surgical masks, some of you I don't see wear surgical masks. So when we make you use those, and especially for uh, IV sterile compounding next year, there's a right and a wrong way. Those blue surgical masks, I say blue because one side is blue, but one side is white. Every year, somebody has the white side on the outside. So when you do them, always grab your face disposable surgical mask from the ear loops. Don't touch the actual cloth part. You're going to grab it by the ear loops, put the blue on the outside, and then turn it either this way or that way. Make sure it's turned so that the metal rod is on the top. That's going to be what bends and conforms to your nose. So get it so that the blue is on the outside, the metal rod is on the top. You're going to wrap it around your face, put the ear loops behind your ear, pinch the nose. And then remember, if you need to, you're going to pull down. There's kind of an accordion thing so that you, the top of the mask should be above the bridge of the nose, and then the bottom should go below your chin, just kind of like the gentleman here. So it is important to get the mask correct. It's probably the most important thing we do to get the mask correctly as we get these vaccines. This is the don't, don't pull it below the nose. It kind of goes across the whole thing there. And the other big thing I'd say is don't touch the mask because as you're breathing in or out and being exposed to things, if you touch it on the outside of the mask, you could expose it or contact it. So don't touch the outside of the mask. Face shield, pretty straightforward. There you have it. I will tell you when you put these on and off, don't touch the plastic shield part of it. Don't actually touch that. You're only ever gonna wanna grip it from the headband. So when you put these things on, you're gonna take it and pull it from the back of your head up to, to the front holding on to the to the headband and get it seated when you're done it's important don't touch the potentially dirty plastic face shield and the shields aren't going to stop the air from coming in and out but if somebody were to sneeze or to cough and they had large particles it would hopefully trap or catch those particles keep them from going in your eye which is one source of being able to be infected and keep some of the larger particles away so it's better than nothing it's a step on top of the face mask which is the most important but don't touch it man so grab it up here on the headband again and pull it off and then you're going to need to clean and disinfect and with a wipe whether it's just a soap and water kind of sort of sort of wipe and then let it get it dry don't let it dry because it, it will warp the plastic so you do want to sanitize it after you've done using it but those face shields are not disposable you need to keep those and clean those and get those ready for the next time you need them all right, gloves, you know how to put on gloves. We'll see. Uh, the latex gloves, I will say size really does matter because if you get them too small, then your fingers are all like this and you can't bend them. If they're too big, then you get these big old blue blobs at the end with the excess gloves and then you don't really have any sensitivity. So make sure you get good tight fitting, but not too tight fitting gloves. So they have to be sized right. You put them on one at a time. And the last thing I would say, is just so you know, it's educational. When you put gloves on, you are donning gloves. You donning gloves is putting them on. What is taking them off? Doffing. So doffing your gloves is when you remove them. And there is a little bit of trick and it's shown in the video, uh, not video, in the pictures here. But here's the deal. So you got both of your gloves on. You're gonna take your one hand here. You're gonna barely reach underneath the cuff on the one here and pull it off. But then you gather it up and you put all of that, you don't touch it, but you gather that that glove in the fist of your still gloved hand and then you take your ungloved hand you go underneath the cuff and then pull it inside out up and over the other glove so that in the end you end up with this one little thing of an inside out glove that has both gloves in it so there is a correct way to take off your gloves oh so what i'm going to do is we're going to get a head start today so we don't have to do quite as much in the, in the for the injection technique lab so what we're gonna do is we're gonna cover everything up to kind of the actual ones that you will be actually giving to each other, which are the intramuscular and the subcutaneous. But that's not the only way to administer vaccines. There are vaccines that you have to be able to give that are administered in ways other than that. So first thing I'll just say, this is kind of important, 
remember to wash your hands. Before you ever go to administer a dose, you are going to wash and sanitize your hands, okay? That's absolutely mandatory. The question is, do you wear gloves? I just told you you had to wear gloves. And that's because in the COVID precaution world, we always wear gloves. Prior to this March, wearing of gloves, to be honest with you, for vaccines is optional. The CDC does not require that providers giving vaccine doses wear gloves. And that's because the potential exposure to blood is minimal. If somebody does bleed, and it can happen, it's a drop of blood or two at the most. It's a small enough volume that it is easily soaked up by a cotton ball. So because of the low amount of blood risk, they say there is no requirement to wear gloves, okay? Can you choose to wear gloves? Absolutely. Will you be wearing gloves for me because of the new COVID issues? Absolutely. However, if you do wear gloves, you have to change them after each patient. So you're going to wash and sanitize your hands, put on your gloves, do your thing, then you're gonna remove your gloves, then you're gonna sanitize your hands, and then you're gonna put on gloves and on and on and on. And think about a very busy, you know, maybe you're gonna be standing out here, it sounds like Joe said in the parking lot, given all these COVID vaccines. If you're wearing gloves, you're gonna be taking them off, sanitizing, putting them on after every single patient, which is just what you have to do. However, that's also why in non-COVID days, they say since it's not absolutely required from a blood protection issue, just sanitize your hands. If you don't wear gloves and you just sanitize your hands, you're ready for the next patient. So anyways, but you will be wearing gloves and you will need to change them after each patient. This just reminds you. So you'll be washing your hands, putting on your face mask, putting on your face shield, putting on your gloves. You will be wearing all of those things. That's what we need to do, okay? Now let's move on to new things. I love Joe's story about the 100% cry rate when vaccinating small children. He obviously is not a big fan of doing this. However, it is a skill you do need to know how to do. And there are ways to handle the issues he did talk about that hopefully you'll be a little bit more trained than it sounded like he was going into this. And that has to do with positioning of the child. You have to have somebody help you. So usually it's the parent. So as you can kind of see in this picture here, what you normally do is have the parent sit down first, spread their legs, and then have the child sit in their lap. Okay, or on their lap. You wanna put the child's legs between the parent's legs and then have the parent gently crush the legs together. All right, meaning to compress the legs and hold them tight. So we want the, the, the child's legs kind of compressed between the parent's thighs. And then the parent is going to reach around that child and give them what I call the great bear hug of love. You're going to love that child. You're going to love them firmly and tightly and pinion their arms straight down at their sides. You'll notice right here, this mom has got her arms around the child and is holding down the arms. Here are arms going around that child and keeping those arms down straight. So yes, they may be wanting to move around and maybe they're crying, but if the parents can hold them nice and tight, then you can get in, do what you need to do and get out. So that is kind of the recommendation. And the reason they chose three years of age for how young a child, a pharmacist can now immunize with this emergency use authorization, it's because starting at three and older, the injection location and therefore technique to some extent is the same. Childs three and older are typically given in the deltoid. So everything we're gonna practice and then I'm gonna tell you about for your adults or for your partners out there now is the same going all the way down. But what Joe mentioned is clearly the size of the muscle gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then the muscle moves around if the child isn't secured. So securing the child and positioning them is very important. The last thing I would, well, let's so, so that's the biggest thing I would say at this point. So beyond my wonderful description, here's kind of a quick video that kind of hopefully shows you a little bit better on how to position the child. And this is a more important concern for you guys because you will very well likely be vaccinating children even as, you know, six are still kind of small and squirmy. You need the parent to help you hold them. Have the adult hold the child on their lap with the child facing to the side. Move one of the child's arms under the parent's arm and behind the parent's back. Then place the adult's arm around the child onto the child's outer arm, holding both the child's arms in place. Put the child's legs between the parent's thighs. Place the parent's other hand on the child's legs near the parent's thigh. If the parent or adult is uncomfortable holding the child, have another person hold the child. This video is- Okay, the last thing I would say about that is that sometimes the parents are 
maybe as bad as the children. And if the parent isn't there or unwilling to help, then you do need another staff person to help you do this. But it takes two people to kind of hold the child lovingly, but firmly to keep them from moving around while you do the injections, okay? Certainly a lot more work than adults, although adults are skittish too sometimes. So let's talk about positioning the adults, okay? So this is you guys. So um, I went out there to listen for the video and I saw y'all all slouching, leaning over. So, okay, if you're gonna inject your person right now, I want you all to get yourself in position for a vaccine, sit up straight, get that back straight, scoot your butt all the way back in the chair. So we don't want you sitting on the edge of the chair. You need to be back all the way in the chair, back straight against the backrest. Look at those armrests, both because those chairs have armrests that go up and down. Make sure the armrests are down. You would only ever want to vaccinate in a chair that does have armrests so that the patient doesn't slide out if they start to feel faint or something. So we want to secure them that way. Legs need to be uncrossed and feet preferably flat on the ground. Now we're going to talk about adjusting height in a minute, but certainly the legs need to be uncrossed, preferably feet on the ground. All right. So, and then lastly, as far as their arm goes, you're going to have to roll up their sleeves okay, to give the shot, but you want to position their arm. They don't want it all straight and all freaky because they're paranoid, relax the arm, but generally you wanna put the arms kind of on the hip so that it makes your arm stick out a little bit like a chicken bone. So instead of straight down like this, kind of put it on the hip so it kind of makes it angle out a little bit more and is exposed that way, okay? So relax, legs uncrossed, seat in back straight all the way in the chair, uh, feet on the floor if you can, and then sh shirt up and then arm with their hand on the hips, kind of pointing out and relaxed, all right? Perfect. So that's really the main things to do and you'll get a chance to practice it. Before I go on though, there is one other thing I really don't like about this lady's position giving this guy a vaccine. And what I would point out here is her eyes, her, her seat height here, her eyes are eye level with his eyes, okay? But the problem is she's looking down on the injection site. What she needs, to, and that's a real problem because if you're standing or you're much higher than your patient, there's a tendency to inject downwards instead of straight at a 90 degree angle. So we wanna inject straight in. We don't wanna inject down on them. So what this lady would need to do is lower her seat down this way so that her eyes are basically eye level with the injection site, okay? There's two ways to do that. You can either raise the patient up or lower yourself down, but you wanna get your eyes at the eye level of their deltoids so that you're kind of working straight in them. So practice this now with your own chairs out there because you're gonna be injecting out there. You're going, it's your responsibility as a pharmacist to, to position your patient. So make sure your partner is sitting correctly, make sure their legs are uncrossed, arms are down, and then have them and try this for yourself if you've not done it. On the bottom, on the right-hand side, there's a little lever, kind of stand up or lift up on that lever and the seat should go up, sit on it, lift up on that lever and it makes you go down. So it's your job to make sure that you raise your patient up and lower yourself down so that you're better on eye level with their injection side in their arm, not just eye to eye with their with your partner. Okay, that's a big difference. And trust me, you, you gotta trust me on this. If you take the time to get your position set right, and especially on the height wise, it's gonna make it much more physically easier for you to be able to do the manipulation. Then if you're looking down or you're having to bend down, if you notice on this picture here, well, where'd it go? Yeah, this one here, do you see where she's kind of bent over there, having to look down? That's, you can do it, but it's, it's much more difficult. So if you can position your patient height wise, boom, it makes it so much easier. All right, let's talk about comforting. Some of you may need comforting right now, thinking about next week or the week after. It's not uncommon. I mean, the idea of a sharp object being poked into your skin can, or into somebody else's skin can be uh, disconcerted, disconcerting. So what can we do? The best thing you can do for your patient is to distract them, okay? So, and for adults, it's easy, just get them talking. Just start having them talking, have them look away. There's no reason to kind of be looking at your partner. So look away and ask them a question. So what are you doing this weekend? And do you think the weather is gonna be nice? Um, just have them start talking. But the idea is to make them talk, not you. So don't just say, but, and you know what I'm doing this weekend, it's not about you talking the entire time. Get your partner, your patient talking about something about their lives, all right? Try to avoid things like, hey, who'd you vote for? Or bring up politics, That's or KU football. Talk about the basketball team. Talk about something happy. Talk about the weather. Talk about something that's easy and light. And the patients kind of know what you're doing, but it helps distract them. They will engage in it, and it will draw their mind away from what you're doing. Okay, so distraction is the best thing. That's also why it's nice to have windows or pictures or artwork or something that patients can turn away from the actual injection and just occupy their mind for the second or two, I won't say second, but maybe 30 seconds to a minute it takes for you to give the injection. 
The only other real alternative that you can do if somebody is really sensitive to the discomfort, okay? And I will still say this, even for comforting yourself, understand this, you are helping your patient. You are providing them a vaccine that is hopefully gonna prevent an illness in them and keep them healthy. You need to know that by causing a little bit of physical uncomfort by injecting this needle, you are still doing a good thing for them. You're not hurting them, you are helping them. You have to believe that, all right? Now, you are gonna cause some degree of physical sensation. The needles we use though are really, really fine. The amount of actual discomfort from the needle going into the skin is minimal. If you want to we can test you. I'll come up to you if you want to practice this and I will flick you. I can flick you on the skin and cause a heck of a lot more sensation than the little bit of needle pressure when it goes in and out. So you have to understand that that little bit of pressure that goes in is usually pretty minimal discomfort. Okay. It's a mental issue. It is the pointy thing going into the skin. That's the problem. It's not really the physical sensation that you're causing the patient. It's a little bit of a little pop sensation. Maybe I shouldn't use that word. Anyways, what you can do if somebody is really, really sensitive about the skin or the pain or the discomfort, one thing you can try, and you can always try this on yourself at some point too, is what we could do is you would take an alcohol swab because we want to try to keep it clean, but right over the side, you would take that swab and you rub it vigorously because remember what's going they're going to feel is the nerve endings. There are some pain receptors there that might get punctured when you stick the needle in. But there are also pressure sensors. So what you can do is take that alcohol swab and rub it pretty vigorously for just a little bit and then go and inject in relatively quickly. And that rubbing activates all those pressure sensors and it kind of numbs the skin. And frankly, since those things are already been activated, it doesn't even notice the little pinprick that goes through when you put the needle in. So that's this idea of tactile uh, stimulation. Uh, it can help minimize some of the discomfort, but frankly, the best thing you can do is something you're not gonna be able to do next week or the week after which is be comfortable and confident at doing it. So that's why the first couple of ones are kind of awkward. By the time you do five injections, 10, 50 by the end of December, you will be a master at doing this, right? It just takes practice. And if you can walk in and be comfortable and confident and just do the steps that you need to do, trust me, when we do this procedure, the needle goes in and comes out in less than 10 to 15 seconds. So if you can do the technique quickly and efficiently, you're going to help the patient feel a lot better about this, okay? But if you're a... Uh, uh, and uh, and you're, uh, no one feels comfortable about that. And you'll probably start there, but work hard on getting it, the system down and you can, you'll can you get past it, trust me, all right? Blah, blah, blah. All right, let's move on to the actual administration of some vaccines other than the IM and sub-Q that we're gonna do. And the first one we'll talk about is the flu vaccine. It doesn't, one of those flu vaccines given by a nose spray. Did you remember what the name was? Flu mist. Remember that's a completely different type of influenza vaccine. It's LAIV, what did that stand for? Live attenuated influenza vaccine. So that flu vaccine is available for patients two to 49 without any sort of chronic illnesses as an alternative. It's really best used for somebody who says, oh man, I ain't getting a flu shot, I hate needles. If they won't get the shot because of the needles, hey, there is an alternative vaccine we could try on you and it's just a nose spray that needs to be sprayed. And usually people are much more accepting of that. All right, so what are some caveats? I'm gonna show you a video that I think does a really good job of showing you how to do it. A couple of things I'd point out is, first of all, they're going to talk about a dose divider clip. That's really important because it's a pre-filled syringe. You don't attach a needle out or anything on it. It's already got its little tip on there for the spray adapter. So you open up the little cap on top. And the trick is, though, that you're going to put, there's 0.2 mils total. So you want 0.1 mil in one nostril. You want 0.1 mil in the other nostril. So as you're squeezing, how are you going to know when to stop? Well, there's a plastic dose divider clip on the plunger so that when you squeeze it, it will stop it for you. You can't go past it. So you don't have to look at the volumes or anything. You just put the, the, the syringe in the nostril and you squeeze until it stops. When it stops, you pull it out, you remove the dose divider clip, and then you go into the other nostril and squeeze the remainder. Okay. Now, two other things I would say is that watch the way she positions her hand. She's going to put her hand on the shoulder and really brace her hand. Because here's the deal. The only way that you get a mist is by a forceful exp expelling that liquid. If you push it really slow, then the liquid just dribbles out. So you got to really squeeze it to get a mist that goes into the nostril. And then lastly, the whole point of the medicine is to get it in the nostril. We don't want it back in the sinuses and we, we don't want to inhale it in the lungs. We want it to spray it in the nostril. So you don't want to sniff or inhale while they're doing it. You also want to point it straight up, not back towards the sinuses to go down the back of the throat. So that's kind of important as well. So with that, let's watch a lady tell you how to give this vaccine. Six, answer client questions. Seven, wash your hands. Eight, sit the patient down. Inform the client about the upcoming steps. 
The vaccine is watery and cold, but with little taste. It is not necessary for them to clear their nasal passages prior to use. It is also not necessary for them to tilt the head, sniff, or otherwise assist the spray during administration. Before using the nasal spray, have the client hold a tissue to catch any dribbled vaccine. Slide the dose divider clip to the end of the plunger farthest from the spray end. Remove the gray protector. Do not touch the exposed tip or set it on unclean surfaces. Note that the spray tip has a line to show how far to insert into the nostril. With a patient in an upright position, place the tip just inside the nostril, up to the line on the sprayer itself. Placement of the sprayer should be vertical into the entry of the nostril, letting the spray wash over the inside of the nostril. The tip should not be pointed back toward the sinuses. With a single motion, depress the plunger as rapidly as possible until the dose divider prevents you from going any farther. Be careful to give plenty of pressure or the dose may dribble out instead of coming out as a fine spray. After removing the sprayer from the nostril, pinch and remove the dose divider clip from the plunger. Place the tip inside the other nostril and with a single motion, depress the plunger as rapidly as possible to deliver remaining vaccine. Immediately dispose of the sprayer in a sharps container. Okay, well there you have it. It's pretty straightforward. And they, when this first came on the market, we thought, all thought this was going to be the end of the injection because why wouldn't you want to get it as a nose spray? Well, there's some issues with that. I won't go to all of them, but the biggest thing you should know, because your patients may ask you, is yes, the flu mist nose vaccine was taken off the market for a couple of years, about two years ago. And it turned out, remember, it's a totally different vaccine. So it was a live virus, not like the flu shot. Well, this live virus turns out it, it wasn't doing nothing. It wasn't conferring any sort of immunity. So they took it off the market and supposedly they tweaked the virus and brought it back and say, oh, now we promise it really will confer and give you antibodies. So supposedly it does. I wouldn't say it doesn't, but I have not seen since it was re-put on the market a direct comparison between the flu shot and the LAIV to see that it's as equally effective. So you need to kind of assume it. The FDA approved it. But be honest with you, what most practitioners, or at least I would say myself, and so take it with a grain of salt, is it is better reserved. If you're willing to get the flu shot, we know that one works. That one has never not worked as long as it matches the circulating strains. The flu mist is a good alternative for somebody who just won't get one otherwise. So that's certainly better than nothing. And I think within a year or two, we'll know whether or not it's still as effective as the regular flu. It's an alternative out there. I've not seen it dispensed a lot, but it is an alternative for somebody who doesn't want to get the flu mist or can't get the flu mist, but won't get a flu shot. That is definitely one of the two alternative ways to give them another chance to get the flu vaccine. The other is this Pharmagen. So this has been on the market now for just two years. So understand Pharmagen is the mechanical system to administer this vaccine with a needle-free system. It uses jet. I'll explain why here in a little bit. It basically just forces the liquid through your skin, through your fat, and into your muscle. So no needles whatsoever involved. And Pharmagen is the system for doing that. So you basically still have to use a normal influenza vaccine. And what it was approved with was the brand Afluria. So you're gonna be using a normal Afluria branded influenza vaccine, and, but you're gonna use this system. And this system, and I'll show you a video here in a minute, you basically suck it up into this really kind of different looking cartridge, which serves as the syringe. There's no needle. You've got this little mini syringe here. You put it into the device, but what you can't see with this reset charger thing here is, Inside this device is a ginormous spring. So before you do anything, you crank down on it and crank that spring back, okay? So then when you put the syringe on it, you push it up against the skin, in the normal place you would normally give it, hit the button and that spring goes whammo and it shoves all that liquid through that little bitty hole through your skin, through this, the tissue and into the muscle. So it works and gets it to where it needs to go, but does it without a needle, right? It's needle free. Does that mean it's sensation free? I don't think so. No, you can still feel it. I'm not saying it's worse, but here, I love this video. So I got this was a guy on a morning TV show showing this new system and it's good, but look at his facial expression. Look at the way he describes it. He doesn't really call it a, a, a pain-free injection. So let's just kind of see how they do it there. Let me try to... It's very simple, Ann. Tell us what you're doing. Well, I loaded the injector, I charged the injector first, and now I'm going to load the vaccine into the syringe. Right. As you can see, there's no needle. So this is similar to, to loading a, a needle, but without a exactly, needle. Exactly, without so, a needle. Now okay. place the syringe in the injector. And it's ready to go. So it's ready to go. So now, now you swab. Now if you'll come over here, I'll prepare my patient. Okay. And just relax your arm here. Okay. 
Have you had a flu shot before? Uh, yeah, every year. All right. But never one like this. Like this. <laughs> well, we'll see. I want to give people an idea of what it sounds like. You just hear that snap, and then there is a little pop, and a it, it does. Click and yeah, a little pressure. It, it doesn't over. feel, uh, I would say, all that different from an injection because flu shots tend to be pretty mild anyway. But mm -hmm. there we go, and get a band aid, and I'm done. There you have it. So I don't know what you thought. I mean, it seemed it went just fine. And from a practitioner standpoint, it's easier than having to do with potential needle stick injuries and sharps and everything else. So once again, I hope this maybe takes off. I'm not sure if it will or not. We'll see. But it is needle free, but it is not sensation free. And that's because I'll still say that 25 gauge needles, those really fine needles that we use, when you do it a good job, there's very little sensation to begin with. And frankly, the jet injectors like this tend to cause more discomfort getting the liquid through without a needle than using the needle. But it's an alternative. So once again, if somebody needs a flu shot but won't do the needle, then this kind of jet injector, this PharmaJet, is a good alternative. Okay, so just a little bit of brief stuff and then I'll turn you loose for the week is uh, for the intramuscular, the ones that we're going to do. So let's just go through a little bit of background so we can just jump into the actual how to do it when you come back. So an intramuscular injection, the way most vaccines are given, where what muscle can you inject a vaccine into? Turns out there's a couple of them. The first one is the gluteus, your buttocks in the upper outer quadrant. So as you can see here on either cheek, though, when you use the cheek or the gluteus as your uh, intramuscular or your muscle to inject in, you need to use the upper outer quadrant. So if you look here on the cheek, only inject in the upper outer quadrant because we're running right down the middle there going down is the sciatic nerve. So we don't want to hit the nerve, so use the upper outer quadrant. Again, not very practical for immunizations to make people drop their pants, so let's avoid that. And some vaccines specifically prohibit that, like hepatitis B can't be given in the gluteus. So okay, you could, but we don't. So there's that one though. The other one that you can get your vaccines in muscle-wise is the vastus lateralis. That's if you look down on your thighs, it's on the outer side between your knees and, and your hips. So on the outside, about 45 degrees, that's the vastus lateralis muscle. Not right down on top, but on 45 degree angle. Didn't we talk about giving some drug administered into your, your thigh on the outside thigh? That's the epinephrine. So when we talked about EpiPens and where to give EpiPens, that's on the uh, vastus lateralis. You can give vaccines there as well. And while it's still not very practical for adults because you still have to pull down your pants or get access to that, there are some people who get all of their vaccines there. And those are the little babies because they got little chubby legs, but they got little dinosaur arms that don't have any deltoid muscles. So that's why less than two, uh, three years of age, we typically use the, the vastus lateralis on their thighs, but at three and older, then the deltoids are, are developed enough that they work and they're much easier to get to. So the ones that you'll be injecting into is the deltoid muscle. So let's focus a little bit on the anatomy of the deltoid muscle. All right. The reason this thing I'm going to tell you now is important is that here next week, when you go to inject in your partner, we're going to talk about finding the site. You're going to be doing the deltoid muscle here, but I'm going to say, okay, draw, look at the midline, which is middle. You want to find a site that's either slightly anterior towards the front or slightly posterior towards the back. So from an anatomical standpoint, why do we want to inject slightly one way or the other? Okay, so that's the whole point of this little bit here. From midline, do we want to go slightly to the front or slightly to the back? Well, this is a picture on here. You can see the slide on here is the picture of the shoulder from the front. So this is the anterior view of the shoulder. You'll notice though, there are some arteries and some nerves that run towards the front of the arm here. And those aren't good things to get close to. So what does it look like from the back? If you turn around from the back, this is what it looks like here. There are no arteries or nerves, it's just a bunch of muscle. And you'll notice the shape of the muscle, if we stay away from the shoulder, we'll talk more about that, and go down to where it connects then to the lower arm, it has kind of a triangle shape, all right? So that's why the answer to my question was, you're gonna wanna go slightly posterior from midline, not all the way around the back, but from midline, go slightly back towards the posterior. And then we wanna talk about how low to do go and how hot. So from now that we know that we're slightly back, let's talk about this triangle. Because what we don't want to do is have the triangle here up here on the shoulder joint. Okay, we don't want it where it connects to the shoulder. And the bone at the end of the shoulder is called the acromion process. So part of what you're going to do is use your fingers to find the acromion process. And again, I took my shirt off and took a picture so you could kind of see my acromion process. If you look here, you can kind of see that bone up there. See, I can hear you from here over Zoom laughing at me. Somebody took their shirt off to do this. But anyways, the bone there is the acromion process. But you'll notice the difference between there and the top of the triangle. We're going to measure that, not with a ruler, but by using two finger breaths. The video I'll show you here talks about three, but we'll have you do two finger breaths 
the width of your two fingers down from the chromium processors. Absolutely, you can see in this picture. We don't wanna be up here. I guarantee you that's where her chromium process is. So we want the top of the triangle to be down at least two finger breadths down from there. That is the worst mistake you'll make. We'll talk about next time is to go too high. So we want to make sure the top of our triangle is low enough that we're not near that. Okay. And then it forms kind of a triangle shape. So we'll talk more about forming a C. This is what we'll have you do in lab is make a C. The last video I'm going to show you here in a minute talks a little bit of a V shape. It's the same shape, but we're going to do more of a C. I'll explain why later. But the, definitely the top part of making sure that we find the chromium process and come down two finger breadth is absolutely important. But this shows you you're trying to visualize the deltoid so that you can find a good spot to inject it into. Okay. Some important background information before we get to the actual injection part to it. So with that, hopefully everything's working right. <laughs> it looks like too many screens to look at. So the slide that I have up here that I'm sharing that hopefully would be on the screen is kind of where we left off last week. And it's, I'm going to go briefly over this, but it's really important. This is not unimportant. When we talk about siding and where to give the injection to them, the most important thing you can do is to make sure that you don't give it too high up into the arm. That is, we don't want to cause the injury known as CIRVA, CIRVA, S-I-R-V-A, shoulder injury related to vaccine administration. It happens when you inject the needle above the muscle, but below the acromion process into the subchromial bursa space. What happens is you damage a tendon, the ligament kind of connecting the deltoid to the acromion, and you go into that shoulder bursa and you inject. So there's some physical damage that can occur. But more, more problematic is the fact that that vaccine works by causing an inflammatory response. So there's inflammation that occurs within the bursa that can cause some temporary to, they say, even lifelong limits in mobility in terms of the arm and being able to move it up and down. So when I talk about and show you how to identify the spot, the most important thing you can do is to inject lower down to make sure you're nowhere near the shoulder area. So serva is an important, and again, Half of the, the lawsuits over serva injuries have been reported from the last couple of years have been at pharmacies. And I think it's from people standing when giving the injections and kind of injecting down versus getting at a nice eye level and injecting straight to where it needs to go and being in too much of a hurry. So I know you're in a busy location in pharmacies and so forth, but uh, again, take the time. This is the number one risk management thing I can tell you is to make sure you inject in the right location. And that location needs to be low enough down the arm that you're nowhere near the shoulder joint, okay? Take that to heart, nowhere near the shoulder joint. Take the time to make sure that you measure and get it an appropriate length down, okay? So that's from the sake of time, the only thing I would cover around that. And needles here in a little bit, we're gonna be playing with needles as you prepare your doses. It's important to understand the two numbers. There are two numbers to describe your needles. The first is length. And the second is gauge. Let's talk about gauge. It's the easiest one to talk about because it's the same for all of the needles you're going to be injecting your partner with. And that is that I'm looking at this picture here, can you see that the larger the number, the smaller the bore or the opening of the needle? So if you look at that picture, would you rather get injected with a 25 gauge needle or a 16 gauge needle? The 25, man, that's a big old hole you put in my arm with a 16 gauge. So to be honest with you, one of the needles in your packet, the red one, is an 18 gauge needle, which is still a big old hole. Why would you ever use an 18 gauge needle? You would never inject a person with an 18 gauge needle, but you're gonna use the 18 gauge needle to inject into the vial. So you have a compounding needle for sucking fluid in and out of a vial, and then you have an administration needle you're gonna to switch to for injecting into your partner. So the, that, the needle that you're gonna inject in your partner would need to have a much larger number, meaning about a 25 or higher gauge. So you'll be using a 25 gauge needle for all your needles that you'll be injecting your partner. What will vary is length, all right? So speaking specifically towards IM, the take home message for that is an IM is a one inch needle. Unless you've got a, part, a, a, a patient who's particularly obese and around the arm and some of the weight guidelines are shown in that slide, there's a lot of obesity within their arm, then you need to go from one inch to one and a half inch. If you've got the little old lady who's basically just a skeleton wrapped in skin, which happens when you get over 70 and 80 and so forth, there's almost no muscle mass there, then you reduce from one inch down to five eighths inch, which is a little more than a half an inch. So remember, I am is one inch or higher for obesity or lower if for somebody elderly or somebody with no muscle mass on their own, okay? Otherwise, you guys are mostly likely gonna get a one inch needle for your IM shots. The good news is the 5 8 inch needle is what we use for sub-Q. 
Okay, and we'll talk about those needles here in a second. So let's, I wanted to make sure we can kind of talk about some of those guidelines there. So let's talk about aseptically loading and preparing the dose. And I'm going to do it first with you. And then when I'm done demonstrating it, and hopefully you watched it on the video as well, then you'll get a chance to prepare your doses. Okay, in the order of things, if you look at the sheet of paper you've got, we're gonna fill that out as well. So grab this sheet of paper and your bag of stuff and let me switch my, um, see if I can do this here, I've been practicing. Open it up and take out some things. Not everything, let's not dump it all out, but what do we need to take out? Let's take out some syringes. You should have three syringes. So find your syringes. You should have two three mils and one one mil syringe. So grab three syringes and lay them out, okay? You should also be able to find three red needles. Three red needles, set those out. And then three other needles, okay? So find three of those needles as well. And then lastly, you're gonna need a vial, your vial of medicine, set that there. And then you're gonna need three alcohol swabs. So grab some alcohol swabs, have at least three of them, okay? So grab those out, leave the rest of the stuff in the bag, in the bag, because you'll need it later, okay? So get all of that stuff out and ready. Okay, so now let's see about organizing these supplies here. So actually, let's just look at the needles and let's start with the syringes. So let's grab the syringes here. I'm gonna just kind of organize myself. You have two three mil syringes. If you look at the side here, you can see there are three mil syringes and you have one one mil syringe, all right? So why the two different syringes? I'm gonna tell you now that when you prepare your doses in a minute, all of the doses are gonna be 0 0.5 mils. That is kind of the typical uh, volume for most vaccines, not all, but most. So every dose you prepare will be 0 0.5 milliliters, all right? Would you agree that you can put 0.5 milliliters in a one mil syringe and you can put it in a three mil syringe? So you really could use either size. So why are we having you use both of these sizes? And it has to do with the comfort of actually doing the injection. So let me show you this. So I'm gonna hold my pen here for the sake of time. Uh, well, let's see, I got a syringe here, hold on. All right, so here's a syringe. What happens when you're gonna see in a little bit, when you get an IM shot, you hold the syringe like a pencil or a pen. So you hold it like this. So for IM, since you hold it like this, it's actually nice to have a little bit wider barrel, okay? Think about your pencil or pens that have kind of those extender, the little squishy things you can hold on to. It's nice to have a little bit wider grip. So the three mil syringes, which are kind of wider in diameter, are more comfortable to hold when giving an IM shot, okay? So these three mil syringes are for your two IM injections. So that's why you have three IM shots, or I'm sorry, two three mil syringes for your two IM injections. So that's why for that. When you give a sub Q shot here in a little bit, we're gonna show you, you actually hold the syringe like this. Would you agree? It looks very different. Because you're holding it between your thumb and your index finger, it's actually more comfortable to have a narrow barrel. So that's why the one mil syringe, if you look on it, it has a much more narrow body. So the one mil syringe is for your sub Q injection. Your three mil syringes are for your IM injection. Okay, so far so good as far as organizing. Okay, now let's talk about the needles that go with it. So let's match up the right injection needles for the right syringes, all right? So let's look at these needles here. Let's compare those. They're kind of, they look kind of similar, but look either along the, below the name or look in the purple. If you look at the, in the purple line in the orange lettering, they should have both the length and the gauge that we just described, kind of talked about. They're all three gonna be 25 gauge. So the, all of those needles have the same gauge. What's gonna be different about them is the length. So you should have some like this one here says 25 G times one. The times one stands for one inch. And you remember, what did we say? Which one has a one inch length that we need to use for an injection is IM. So let's match up those needles with the three mil syringe. And the one single by itself, you should have one that says 25 G times five eighths. Five eighths is the size for the subcutaneous injection. So let's match up that syringe and that needle together. So the one mil syringe with the five eighths inch needle and the three mil syringes with the one inch needles. Okay. Now that leaves you three of these red needles. So if you wanna look at the red needles and flip them over, you can see that they basically say that they're blunt fill, meaning that they're not real pointy to help minimize you sticking your finger. We're still gonna to try to avoid that. But more importantly, you'll notice that they're one and a half inches long, so they're long, but they're also 18 gauge. 
So, uh, or 16, no, 18 gauge, 18 gauge. These three, because they're so long and such a small gauge, meaning a big hole, would never want to inject a patient with. These are going to be used when you attach to prepare your dose. Okay, so we're going to prepare the dose with that. And let's slide that over there so you can get them closer without having to do that. Thank you. So there's the ones for preparing the dose. And then lastly, that gives us our vial there. So our medicine. Let's do one thing real okay. So we got our medicine vial there. And then you've got your alcohol swabs. Oops, I need one more swab. Alcohol swab for disinfecting the top and the lid. So we're going to need to clean the top of the vial. Okay. So we have those there. Everything good so far. All right, so now before we actually prepare it, let's go ahead and fill out our form. So let's talk about filling this form out. This is really, really important. So before we actually do the dose preparation, let's get the information we need off of here. You see where it says on top, your name, please print, please print your name and do this legibly. Again, this is the sheet I'm gonna use for your documentation for doing this and for your attendance. So clearly use your best handwriting, please, and print your name and then put your date on there, put the today's date. Okay, so do that. Below this, you're going to print your partner's name. So this is the person who will be injecting you. So who is going to inject you? So print their name. So it's a good time to introduce yourself if you don't know who's gonna be injecting you. So find their name and print their name there. All right, so the top line is your name printed. Then the second line is your partner who's going to be injecting you their printed name. And then we're going to start filling this out. And I will give you the, the information as we go along so we can work on this together. So let's start here with the date given. And again, there are three spots because you're going to be giving three injections. So some of this information is the same for all three of these. So let me zoom in a little bit. This is crazy for me. I apologize if it seems a little bit weird. But looking here, the best that I can. We're doing this. Okay, so this first row here says, well, where is it? Date given. <laughs> so, this is so creepy. All right, date given. So put 11, 12, and you can just fill it on the top line and just put a line straight down. If the information is the same for all three doses, just fill out the top line and then go down. So date given 11, 12 of 20, and then put a line down. Vaccine given, go ahead and look at your bottle here and yours may look a little bit different than mine. And look what it says, it should say 0.9% sodium chloride or 0.9% NaCl. So go ahead and write that down as the vaccine given and put a line straight down, okay? After that, I'll give you a second to write this down. There's a lot number, a manufacturer, but you need to also add in the manufacturer the expiration date. So write the lot number, the manufacturer, and the expiration date. And make sure the, ex the vial is not expired. We don't want you to inject yourselves with expired sodium chloride. If it's expired, I've got some non-expired stuff here on this cart. Instructors, feel free to come get uh, and replace any vial if it were to be expired, but I, I tried not to do that. But make sure it's not expired. Do not inject yourself with uh, expired saline. So give a moment and write the lot number, the manufacturer, and the expiration date from the vial that you've got here in front of you. All right, I'm gonna move on. Hopefully I can't, I, there's no feedback in this room by myself. Anyways, let's go with dose. The dose is the same for all three. So write 0 0.5 mLs, 0 0.5 milliliters, 0 0.5 mLs for the top line and put a line straight down. All three doses will be 0 0.5 mLs. The route is going to be different. So the first two write I am, so I am, then I am, and then put SC for subcutaneous. So you should have an I am and an I am and a subcutaneous. Okay. Then under site, we'll leave that blank for now, but above the site, write down the two possible abbreviations. You're either gonna use RA or LA, right arm or left arm. So LA for left arm, RA for right arm, leave that blank and you'll need to fill that in depending on which side you end up injecting your partner with. Or they in, so make sure when your partner injects you, they, they document which arm you were injected in, okay? And then lastly, and this is important to kind of clarify this, it says date on the VIS, date the VIS was given, okay? What does VIS stand for? Vaccine information sheet, right? So for the date the VIS is given, the last column, go ahead and put today's date again. So put 11, 12 of 20 down. We're gonna be giving your partner, or you'll be given the VIS today, essentially. But the date on the VIS documents the date of that VAS, the basically the date it was updated. So if you turn this page over, I did give you an example of a VIS for influenza down here. 
And then on the right hand side, I did put the most recent VIS date. So that's the date of the VIS. So if you look on there, it says uh, 8 15 of 2019. 8 15 of 2019 is the most recent version of the VIS for the influenza vaccine. That comes from this part in the bottom right hand part of the actual VIS. That's what gets documented over here on the date on the VIS. Okay. So I'll give you a second to get that kind of done. Realize what we are doing, the, the APHA form that you're filling out here, this information is what is legally required for the pharmacist to document to be covered under the VICP, the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. So that limited liability, if you want your patient, if they go home and have an adverse reaction to the vaccine, you don't want them to sue you, right? So if to be a part of, to be protected under this liability clause, you have to collect this information when you prepare doses, okay? And when you administer. So this is the minimal documentation required by law. So that's what we were supposed to be practicing doing, okay? Once you're done with that, then come down here and it's a signature of the immunizing pharmacist. So go ahead and sign your name. You've been promoted to pharmacist. So go ahead and sign pharmacy under the, or pharmacist under the title. Don't get excited, your pay is the same. But anyway, sign your name, put pharmacist down there and then leave the rest of this blank. The rest of this will be completed by the instructor who observes your injection doses. And again, this is what you'll have to turn in when you're all done, okay? So get that done and then set it aside. It's very important though that that gets done. So I'm gonna get them checked to see if everything's going okay. Let's start preparing our doses. And again, instructors out there, if I if something's going, if I need to slow down or do something weird or different, please come in and, and tell me if I'm not on track with everybody. Thank you. All right, so let's prepare the doses. Now, we're gonna start by watching me do it, okay? So do not do it at the same time, but let's kind of watch me prepare my first intramuscular injection. So the only thing I wanna have right here where I need to get the stuff is what I need for the dose I'm preparing. So I'm gonna take my sub-Q in supplies and move them away. I'm going to only have one three mil syringe and I only want one one inch needle. The other two I'm gonna set aside. Remember I only need one preparing needle. So I'm gonna set my remainder aside and I'll need one alcohol swab and my drug bottle. So hopefully like kind of you watched on the video, it's best to kind of organize it, whether it's left to right or right to left, you can decide. But if I need this first, then I'm gonna need this, then I'm gonna use this. Lastly, I'm gonna do that. So I'm gonna go from this side over here, over this direction. And I've kind of organized my supplies here, all right? So don't do it as I'm talking. You need to try to remember this so that we can kind of watch and prepare it. All right, so I'm gonna start by removing the plastic cap for the vial. Now, this does not go back on. So this can just be thrown away. By thrown away, you can put all the trash, that paper trash you generate into that plastic bag. So that same plastic bag can be where you put all your trash as well, paper trash, all right? That physically protects the top, but it doesn't guarantee sterility of the, the rubber vial on top. So we want to use the alcohol swab for doing that. So the next thing I'm gonna do is remove my alcohol swab. And then I'm gonna do three swipes with a different part of the, the swab in the same direction. So one swipe away from me, turn the swab, two swipes, turn the swab, three swipes in the same direction, okay? That keeps you from putting contamination on the swab back onto the vial. That's why you move the swab between each one of your swipes, okay? Then you can set that aside. We're gonna let it dry. Don't blow on it, don't fan it, just let it be, okay? It will dry itself. While it's drying, we need to go ahead and attach the compounding needle to our syringe. So I would start with my three mil syringe. And again, they peel themselves open. So make sure you peel it open carefully. So we don't want to rip the paper. So peel it open, withdraw the syringe. Now I'm going to do something you're not going to want to do with yours. I'm going to point out things that you don't want to touch on a syringe. The two places you don't want to physically touch with the syringe is the needle where the needle attaches to the hub. So I'm going to screw in the needle here. So don't touch that. That needs to remain sterile. The other thing that you don't want to touch is that as you pull the plunger out, so as you would pull back on the plunger, you'll notice there is part of the plunger here that goes back into the body of the syringe. So as I push the syringe plunger in, you notice it goes back into here. So don't grab it like this on the long part of the plunger. So you'll notice part of the plunger sticks out. I don't know how well you can see all that from the end anyway. So you can grab and manipulate. And in fact, the way you grab and manipulate is to hold the disc between your thumb and your middle finger, and you use your index finger on the flange to push and pull. So that's how you manipulate up and down by doing that. So that's where you want to touch, but don't grab it right there in the middle on the plunger part that goes inside the barrel. Okay. So it's going to come like this. So I can set it down, but I don't want it to touch the tip. So on your counter, if you can kind of stand it up like that, that works really good because now what I need to do is open up my needle. So I'm going to open my needle up, doing the same thing, unpeeling it and pulling the paper back. 
with the needle. You don't want to touch the hub. So don't come to anywhere. Don't put your hands anywhere or your fingers anywhere near the hub. Hold it from near the bottom there. Then I'm going to take my syringe and I'm going to line them up. And then it's a righty tighty. So turn the, the needle to the right and tighten it up there. Make it nice and tight. Now don't over tighten it because you can break this plastic, but make it nice and firm. You don't want it to fall off as you're manipulating. And then I'll remove the paper outer wrap. So now I can set this down since the tip is covered and that's pretty much ready to go. All right. Now, the other thing to know before we go any further is that this is a closed system. That means that when I want to pull fluid out of the vial, I have to replace with air the same volume that I'm going to be pulling out of fluid. So since I'm going to do 0.5 mils, what I need to do is start over here, trying to get closer on this, and pull back to 0.5 mLs. Okay, so if you can see the 0.5 there, there's the 0.5. The trick is knowing on the plunger, the volume is measured from the edge of the black part that's in contact with the fluid. So the part on the top of the black plunger that's touching the fluid, that's where you're going to line up the volume marker, not the base of the black plunger that's touching the white part of the plunger, so the very tippy top. Now, sometimes there's kind of a little narrow cone in, in there. It's the part of the black plunger that's actually touching the edge. So the part that touches the edge, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit more. Okay, so for me, well, there's the one, there's the 0.5. So if I push it up, push, there's one. I keep going, keep going, keep going. So keep going right around there is lined up. So that's where 0.5 would be on my syringe. So it's the top of the black part that's in touching the fluid that's lined up against the marking of the volume you want. So that's 0.5 mils, all right? So I'll we'll just leave it at that for now. Okay, so now I'm ready. Let me zoom back out. Now I'm ready to inject into the vial, but I've got to remove the cap. Now this is important here. What you need to do is learn a term to try to avoid a finger stick injury because what happens here, if you just remove the plastic, there's a tend to bounce back and you see where that could stick my finger. So when you remove a cap on any needle, what you're gonna to wanna to do is hold it near the end, hold it like this and think of the word space because we're in space, right? Doesn't things just float away? So when I do this, I'm going to go over this and go space and keep floating that cap away. I know it went off screen, <laughs> it's so weird. So recap the needle. Point being here, if I do it down low here like this, maybe. So I'm going to turn it like this and go space and have that cap float away before I don't come back and jam it, okay? Don't throw this away, you need this again. You're gonna have to recap to remove the needle. So set it aside so you can get back to it, all right? So now I got my syringe and needle ready to go and I'm ready to go into the vial. Leave the vial on the counter. Do not hold it up into the air. Things will move around on you. So keep it on the counter, all right? So from the counter, I'm trying to think of the best place to put it on the screen here. From the counter, hold it down, however you want, but hold it steady. You're then gonna take this, the needle and line up the angle. So it's too hard to show you this now, but there's an angle to the needle cut. You don't wanna go straight up and down like this because that'll put more of a hole into the vial. So if you angle it so that the, the, the bevel, the, the tip and the heel of the bevel cut is straight up and down. So it's a little bit of an angle. So for me, trying to show you that, it, the angle would be right around there. So it's a little bit of an angle and then you push in and it goes in, voila, okay? Not great to show on the video. Push the air in, so I've injected all of my air. Now I have to invert the vial to be able to do this. So I'm gonna hold the vial. And again, what I don't wanna do is keep my fingers, I don't wanna hold it right there where the needle is going into the, the vial. So hold it away so that you can hold it like this. Hold it straight up and down. Do not go at an angle, go straight up and down if you will. And then you're gonna pull down on the plunger. The first thing you're gonna get is some solution and bubbles. So the best thing to do is to kind of squish up fast, then pull back slowly. Oh, there's still some bubbles. Push up fast, pull back slowly, okay? And you're probably still gonna get some bubbles, okay, possibly. So keep doing that until you get some of the volume there. Now, I'm gonna pull back a little bit past 0.5, I don't know if you can see that or not. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over here and flick it, okay? Hold the thing like this, do a little bit of a flicking. Uh, where can you see that from? Okay, like this maybe. Tapping, 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 flick. And try to do it while holding it straight up and down so that the air bubbles will float up. So once you do that, then you can squish it all the way back up, pull back slowly, and you will eventually get 0.5 mLs as the final volume, okay, with no bubbles in the solution. Once you have that, then you're gonna re-invert it Carefully withdraw the needle, okay? 
take the cap here and you're going to want to recap it, but you don't want your fingers anywhere close, right? You don't want to jam that into your fingers. So get your hands away, tip, put the tip of the needle in there, tilt it up just a little bit, then you can come back and recap the needle. Okay, that's called chasing the needle. That's ready to go. The last thing to do is remember that's not the right needle. So you're going to have to remove that. So let me get one supply here. Let me put over here. That needle is going to have to go into a sharps container. So there are sharps containers at the end and the top between you and your partner across from you near the end cap. There is a sharps container. So that's what you'll need to put this when you're done with your, each of your needles. So when you're done with that, then I'm ready to replace the needles. So I'm going to start by opening or un peeling apart, start to peeling, peel a little apart. Now I'm going to hold that. I'm going to use my little alligator finger here to clamp down on that needle as I unscrew it and then screw this one in like this. Voila, that's ready to go. Okay, where does this go? It goes into the sharps container. And I have prepared one of my doses. You will do another dose just like that for the other I am. So I'm going to go ahead and try to quickly prepare my as my subcutaneous dose so you can see that difference and then I'm going to let you do it. All right, so let's get the supplies I'm going to need for that. So that's the one mil syringe, the five eighths inch needle, another compounding needle, just one, and then an alcohol swab. All right, now I say that because we have to re-swab the top of that vial after each dose we prepare. So take a new alcohol swab, do the same thing. So one, two, three, let it dry. Going to take this and open it up. Seal it open. Okay. Set it down carefully without touching the tip. Let's open up the needle. Screw it on there, righty tighty, nice and tight. Set that down. Now I'm going to pull back the 0.5 mils on this. So we'll make sure the plunger gets lined up at the 0.5 mils. And actually at this point, if you do a little bit less than the 0.5, it may help avoid some of the drippage that may occur, but it's supposed to be 0.5, but sometimes if you do a little bit less, it's actually a little bit easier to do from a practical standpoint. I'm now ready to go. So I'm going to space the cap off my needle. I'm going to hold the vial down carefully while I go in at my angle of my bevel and inject. Okay, now what may happen here by your second and your third dose, we have poked a hole in this vial a little bit and it might drip. That's okay, don't freak too much out if it starts to drip a little bit. It may happen after the first one. So again, I'm trying to uh, hold it so you can kind of see, there we go. Inject the air, then pull back on the needle so the tip of the needle is in the fluid. Pull back slowly, big old air bubble squish up fast. Pull back slowly, still got an air bubble squish up fast. Slowly. And wow, I don't really have a big air bubble, so I'm going to go back a little bit past 0.5. And then going to maybe flick a little bit and get rid of any of the little bitty air bubbles, push them up, make sure my final volume is 0.5 mLs. I think that looks good. Pull out, withdraw that, get my cap over here, put the tip in, place it down, set it down. Let's pre-peel these from now on. Okay, all right, peel it open. Alligator, grab it, squeeze it on there, voila. So I have prepared two do oh, needle into the sharps. So I've done two of those. So you'll need to prepare two of the one mil, or I'm sorry, two of the three mils with a one inch needle and one one mil syringe with a five eighths inch needle. So last thing before I'm gonna come out and have you start doing this, I will remind you, this is important. Once you're done preparing these, when you go to actually get the real injections, you give your syringes to your partner to inject into you. So you are going to be injected with the needles and the doses that you prepare. So do your best to avoid touch contamination. Make sure you get rid of the air bubbles. Make sure it's the right volume with the right needle length with the right syringe. So take the time to make sure you do it right because you will be injected with the doses you prepare. So with that, go ahead and start preparing them now. The instructors will be wandering around. I'm going to come out there and help you get these three doses prepared so that we can then practice the injections. All right, let's continue on with, hopefully you can see the PowerPoint on Zoom. I'm going to kind of go through. I am going to do this kind of description-wise. We'll look on the pictures, and then I will do it live kind of on our mannequin in here. So we'll try to do it both ways. So with that, 
things out of the way. We have aseptically loaded and prepared our dust. So we are now ready for the next part to this, which is equally as important. And there's some textual information there. We've done that. Okay, let's talk about identifying the site, okay, on this. So if I was gonna do that, we talked about this a little bit before. So if I try to see if I can show you a little bit on the screen here, show you on my guy right here, what we're talking about, and then you're gonna practice on your partner here in a minute. The idea is you take the shoulder here. So you're gonna to need to look at the shoulder. You're gonna take whichever hand will make a posterior C. Since this patient has their left arm that I'm gonna inject, I'm gonna use my right hand to form the C. Because if I use my left hand, my C would be opening up kind of towards the front of it. So I wanna make sure Again, if you look at the, my guy here, this is the back side over here. This is the front over here. You're gonna take your middle finger and you really do, and you don't have to pound them or anything, but you need to kind of press down until you can feel on him the hard, it's, it's hard right there and then it gets soft. So right there is the acromion process. I'm doing that with my middle finger so I can set two fingers down. Do you see where I've got two fingers down from that spot? And then I'm going to wrap around and make a C. My thumb here is going to be in line down the midline. So I'm sighting my fingertips and thumb show me the midline of the arm. And again, I've got a nice curved C going posterior. Here's the midline. And then I look at the shape of the muscle. And this is important. Everyone kind of doesn't overemphasize this. But if you look at this guy's arm here, it's puffier right here. There's not as much muscle up here and it tapers away down here. So right in around here is the beefiest part of the muscle. So if I look at my C here, there's my midline, I'm gonna go slightly posterior in the roundest part, the meatiest part of the muscle. So right there is where I would target for my patient to do, okay? So let's go ahead and practice on each other real quick. Make sure you put your, this is good, put your face shield on and your mask and try to, and again, the instructors will go around, but this is a very important part. This is one of the most important parts of the technique is making sure you find the right spot. So let's take a minute to practice on each other face shields and face masks and gloves on and make sure let's practice this. All right, guys, let's move on so we can keep going here. But I'll just end with saying, take your time to make sure you're comfortable on where you're going to inject. It is the most important thing to do to make sure that you get low enough away from that acromion process that you're into the meaty part of the muscle and you're not sitting too high in, in the maps, okay? So with that, let me keep going here. So now pretend like you know exactly where you're gonna go. You're not gonna leave your finger there. You're gonna have to turn away from it. So maybe once you've sighted, look for maybe some hairs, maybe a little spot. There's a little thing, maybe two down from that little freckle there. Find a room, try to remind yourself where it is. You're gonna go get an alcohol swab and then prepare the site. So we're a little maniacal about this because there is a theoretical best way to do this. So everyone grab an imaginary alcohol swab. Boom, there it is, okay? So I keep forgetting I haven't switched this. So hold on one second. Uh, this is too much tech for me. Okay, there you are. So grab an imaginary swab, boom, okay? Hold it right over the spot. So you're gonna go right to where the spot is, and then you make a little circle. Everyone make a little circle. Make a little bigger circle. Keep getting spiraling out and bigger and bigger, and then stop and let it dry. Don't do this, don't go, okay? Because what you're doing is not only using alcohol to disinfect, but you're sweeping. So you wanna start right at the spot and sweep away in larger circles, pulling any debris away from your site as you disinfect. So it doesn't do any good to get bigger and bigger and bigger and then go back into the middle or get bigger, 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 and then still do a little, oh, right there. Bigger, 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 stop, and then let it dry. Don't fan it, don't blow on it, that's gross, just let it dry, okay? Because while it is drying, you're gonna get the things you need for after the injection, okay? So let's talk about what are some other things in your bag here. So go ahead and let's look in the bag and let's pull out just so we can kind of make sure we know what we're looking at, the things you're gonna need for after the injection. So, for example, what if I've got my IM syringe, and I know it's the IM syringe because it's the three milliliter syringe with the one inch needle, so I've got that ready. So I've got my syringe ready. What else am I gonna need afterwards? For each injection, you're gonna want at least, uh, I'd have two cotton balls out. So you'd want two cotton balls. Probably only need one, but it's not a bad idea to have two. So we'll look out. So we'll, so, okay, so we'll just leave it at one cotton ball. One cotton ball, one Band-Aid, and again, uh, one cotton ball, one Band-Aid, and you're gonna need your Sharps container. So all of those things are what you're gonna need for afterwards. And 
I'm trying to do this right. I'm not doing a great job. So Sharps container, we'll talk about where it's going to go. And you're going to need a Band-Aid, a cotton ball, and your syringe. All right. So with this, this, we'll talk a little bit more about where to put the Sharps. Well, let's just say the Sharps container, we're going to watch you. It's probably sitting up kind of on your counter now. We don't want it left there. You're going to want to put it on the floor between your feet. Okay, so that you can go out of the pay, you're going to go out of the person and straight into the sharp. So again, you're going to want this uh, as much as it goes between on the ground between your legs so you can go out of the patient there. So let's put that, I'd set that where it needs to go. Okay, then you're going to want your cotton ball and your band aid, but you'll notice that the band aid's already paper wrapped. So that's not very convenient. So you're not going to want to have to be flipping with this as the patient's bleeding. So part of it getting ready while we're waiting for the arm to dry is to get the band aid and go ahead and open up the paper wrap. Okay, you don't have to pull the, pa the band aid out, but to get it to where that's ready to go, my cotton ball, and if my patient is right here, Lordy. So I have this stuff kind of conveniently located where I can get to it quickly, okay? And my sharps container is on the feet on my floor, okay? And I got my syringe ready to go there, all right? So my point being in all that amount of time, it allows you, allows the alcohol to dry on the patient. So in that amount of time, you've gotten ready for what you're gonna need after the injection while they're letting the screen or <laughs> the arm dry, okay? So now we are ready to go back to here and we're ready for the injection. So I'll walk, I'll just talk through these techniques and then I'll show you. The thing that you're gonna to wanna to do is, and let's let me change my camera here. Try this. So again, what I'm trying to show you is that you're compressing the skin tight, not bunching it up. So take your arm here if you want and take your fingers like this and pinch and elevate, pinch a fold of skin and lift up. See, that's not what we're doing. This is what you're gonna do for a sub -Q. You grab and you elevate the skin. What you're gonna do now is use your fingers to press away from each other. Make the skin tight between your two fingers. By making the skin tight or taut, it allows the needle to penetrate the skin more easily. And again, uh, so it makes the needle entry easier. And when you release, then the skin slides back and helps cover the hole. So there's a little bit less bleeding potential. So we wanna make the skin tight, okay? Don't bunch it up. So you're gonna do that. That kind of talks about a little bit of the rationale behind that. Now, this is what we do for normal weight people is make the skin tight, all right? What will happen, there are some exceptions and I just thought to bring this up and especially with low muscle mass patients. And this could be the very young. So now that we're doing six or even younger for IM, again, if you've got a skeleton person with just skin on it, then instead of pressing the skin tight, you can actually bunch and pull the muscle together. So that's where you're kind of bunching it, like again, not lifting, but you can bunch the muscle together. Not typical, but if you've got some really old lady or, or guy who does got no muscle, then you can bunch some of the muscle together. That's the exception to the rule. For everyone out there that I can see, you're gonna be making the skin nice and tight so that the needle goes through that skin real easily, okay? So by now, if you look at his hand, fingers here, he's got the skin pushed away from each other. So it's nice and tight between there. There's the injection spot. He's got the syringe held comfortably and I'll show you how to hold it like a pencil. And you're gonna start one inch away. You'll notice he's not right up at the skin. You start one inch away, 90 degrees and it's one smooth motion until the needle goes all the way up to the hub. So you're gonna insert it so that there is no silver. You shouldn't see any silver left in the, of the needle, you need to go all the way to this plastic part of the hub, okay? Notice that this hand, the, at this point, the hand is still keeping the skin tight and this hand has got a nice control over the syringe at this point, okay? Once you've gone all the way to the hub, the, just wanna make sure you understand, for some injections, they do what's called aspiration, which means at that point, you'd actually pull on the plunger to make sure that the tip of the needle is not in a blood vessel. Remember, we're trying to put it in the muscle, not directly as an IV into the blood. So for some drugs, you pull on that to make sure that you don't suck back any blood. If you ended up by random chance, in a artery or vein, then when you pull back, you see a little bit of blood, then you would pull the needle out and discard that. So all I'm trying to say here is we don't do that. So if you hear about aspiration, vaccines as an injection, you do not aspirate. So you're going to, as soon as you go all the way into the hub, depress the plunger, you push the plunger all the way in. So now you can see this black plunger has gone from there all the way in. So we've depressed the plunger, injected the fluid into the muscle of the arm, all right? So at that point, we're done. We're gonna remove the needle straight in the same angle it went in at. And at that point, once that needle is out of the person's arm, there's two things that might happen. 
they might bleed. And again, it would be a drop of blood, just the kind of a dribble of blood that might start to occur. And you've also got the tip of the needle, which is a now a dirty sharp. It's, it's, it could potentially contaminated with a bloodborne pathogen. Which is more important? Do you deal with the patient's blood on their arm or do you discard safely the needle into the sharps? The answer is the sharps. You're going to activate the safety engineer sharp that I'll show you here, discard the needle, then put the cotton ball on the blood. So just remember when you withdraw the needle, dispose of the needle first, then get the cotton ball and then deal with the patient and put some pressure on them, okay? It's most important for you to discard that needle first, all right? All right, and that's just kind of what this is talking about. It's the most important thing for yourself from a technique part that once it's out, you activate it and drop it in the sharps and then get the cotton ball onto the patient, all right? You're gonna put cotton ball onto the, the patient, even if you don't see blood. And I would say 60 to 70% of most injections, there's no blood at all. Sometimes you don't even know where you injected. Just put the cotton ball in your best spot, keep some pressure on it, because you're trying to stop any bleeding from occurring. So put pressure on it for about five seconds. Then that cotton ball, since it's considered a biohazard, because it might have blood, goes into the sharps. And then lastly, you're gonna put the Band-Aid over the site. Just because just it's not bleeding now, doesn't mean it might not bleed a little bit later. So it's best to cover it up with the bandage. Okay, and if you do well, you get a happy patient. Does anyone recognize this patient? Does anyone know that the person in these pictures all this time was Dean Reagan a long, long time ago? But anyways, so he's very happy with our technique, okay? So let me show you kind of an interesting video. This is a traumatic event for all healthcare professionals giving their first shot. So I'm gonna show you a quick video of some nursing students. Now this nursing student, I want you to realize, given what we talked about here, she does some things really good. She's got good hand positioning and hold that syringe steady. So she's got good skin compression. She injects the needle just fine and stabilize it while she does it, okay? And even afterwards, she does a good job bandaging. The problem is what I want you to look about is they talk about aspirating, pulling back, which is something you should not be doing. And more importantly, after the injection, she pulls the needle part of the way out and starts to go get to the cotton ball. Like that's thinking about the next step while the needle is still in the arm and could potentially move around. So make sure you don't do that. You pull it straight out and then she doesn't cover it while she's doing the bandaging thing. So there's a dirty needle. And even look at the patient's eyes because she flashes a thing like she realizes that's not a safe thing to do with that needle. It needs to be covered immediately and then tend to the patient. So let's see what you see what you think. Oh, I didn't hit the button. <laughs> Nice and steady, good injection. Stabilization is good. Now here, watch after the injection. There you go. So just some issues with doing that. So I'm gonna demonstrate here in a minute. The main pitfalls we wanna avoid is this all idea of darting. So it's this mental thing. Trust me, when you go to inject with the needle, there is no resistance. It will just go through. So you don't have to have to shove it in, okay? It just goes in just nice and smooth. So no darting. When you get in, you need to make sure you go all the way to the hub touches the skin, but no further. If you dimple the skin, then you're letting the needle in the syringe go further in than it needs to. And that could cause some discomfort. Okay, we're also going to make a big deal about making sure that you hold it steady, that we don't want it to move around while you're doing it. Okay, and then this idea of uh, even after the injection, then as you with, remove the needle, you don't want to just admire your work. You're going to cover the needle, dispose of the needle, get the cotton ball, and put the pressure on. So, those are the things we're going to want to do. So, let me kind of go through the IM injection technique with you and put it into motion here. The best that I can given my equipment here. Wrong way. Okay, so I got my person here. Let me kind of go through all of the steps here as quickly as I can. So we talked about, okay, let me find the spot. There's a hard spot, C, a chromium process. So let's see, on my fingers posterior, there's the medius part of the muscle. So I'm gonna inject right there. So right there. Now I'm not gonna leave my finger there. I'm gonna get a nice visual. That's where I wanna go. So then I'm gonna get my alcohol swab. I should have had ready over here. There's my alcohol swab. Open it up, take it like this, go right over the spot that I think I'm gonna inject at. Small circle, bigger circle, bigger circle, and stop. Now that that's disinfected, what do I need to do for afterwards? I'm gonna need a cotton ball. Where's my cotton ball? So there's my cotton ball, okay? Where's my 
sorry, I don't know what you guys can see. So there's cotton ball. There's my Band-Aid. What about my sharps container? It's going to go on the floor um, next to my feet, OK? Just so you guys can see it, I'm going to set it here. But it's on the floor next to my feet, all right? So the three things I have for afterwards are ready to go. Here's my syringe. My spot is now dry and ready to go. I'm going to take the cap off. What's the word? Space. Gonna remove the cap. All right, so here's my syringe. Now let's talk about how to hold it. Like I said, you're going to hold it like a pencil. You don't want to hold it too far towards the needle here. You don't want to be too close to the needle, but you don't want to hold it too far back to where you can't get a good angle on it either. So hold it nice and comfortably. With these syringes, you want to hold it where the grasshopper leg is pointing down, pointing down. So the grasshopper leg is down. What would be wrong is if I was holding it like this. That would be grasshopper leg up. So turn it so that the grasshopper leg is down. Okay, so hold it nice and comfortable. Now, there's two different ways to inject. And on the videos, hopefully you watch those. You can, your, your idea is to find the one that works best for you. You don't have to do both methods. I'm gonna show you both methods because some people like one over the other. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch hands. So hold it in your dominant hand. So this is my dominant hand here. I've got it nice and comfortable like a pencil. Take my non-dominant hand and watch. I'm gonna set my palm on their shoulder, bend over with my hand and spread the skin tight. I'm not punching, I'm pushing away, okay? I'm gonna take my syringe here with a needle leg down, and I'm gonna go right over the spot one inch away. So one inch away, then it's one smooth motion all the way to the hill. Okay, I don't know if you can see, you see where that's, there's maybe some silver sticking out. So I'm not all the way in, it's gotta go all the way into the hill, all right? Can you see that if I push too far, there's a dimple? That's what I mean by dimpling, that's too far in. So just to where there is no gap between the hub of the needle and the skin. Okay, so let me do that again. Arm here, push down, make it tight. Come over here, one inch away, one smooth motion all the way in. Now this is important. It's an impaled object. We don't want it to move, right? So before I let go of anything, I'm gonna take this hand and slide down just a little bit, extend my thumb and index finger and grab the syringe. Now with my dominant hand, I can let go. Do you see that that syringe is not moving at all? Because I've got a good grip between these fingers and my palm of my hand is resting on their shoulder. So that's not moving anywhere. Now I can take my dominant hand, Come around where the plunger is, make sure my two fingers are behind the flanges, inject, push the plunger in as quickly as I can, doesn't have to be super hard and fast, but quickly. Then here's the deal, I'm going to put my hand back and hold it just like I did when I injected with my dominant hand, and my non-dominant hand, fingers are going to go away, I don't want them near the tip of that dirty needle, then I'm going to come out at the same angle. Voila. We'll talk about the afterwards here in a second. So let me do that one more time, kind of in real speed, so again, hand here, make it nice and tight. Come over one inch away, one smooth motion all the way in, extend and grab, inject, grab, fingers away, come out. Okay, that's where I'd say 60 to 70% of the people like that way, but there's another way that some people prefer better. So let me show you this, okay? The alternative way is to, it changes on how you hold the syringe. You still hold it with grasshopper leg down, kind of like we talked about, but watch. The problem here is the hub is over here but my palm is over here. So do you see there's like about an inch between the end of the hub here and then my thing. So watch this, watch this. I'm gonna take my hand and I'm just gonna pull back with my fingers. Uh, this, 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 this. Now don't do that or that. We gotta keep it straight. So we wanna keep it straight, but I can go from this, pull back to this. By doing this now, the hub of the needle is right in line with my palm. And you'll see why that makes a difference here. This is uncomfortable for me. My hand is, I can feel it but it's, you'll see why there's some advantages to this. But if you can get comfortable to where before you inject, you can get this like this pulled back so that the hub and your palm are lined up and watch this. Okay, so I'm gonna switch hands here. So this is my dominant hand, I'm gonna do the same thing. Pull back so that it's in line. Now you can see that. So again, comfortable, not comfortable with pull back. Now the hub's in line. Take this hand, do the same thing. Rest it here, pull it down. I'm gonna come back one inch away and inject. But now because of that angle, if I release here, do you see the palm of my hand is resting on their arm? So I can hold this steady now with my dominant hand. So I release with my non-dominant hand. And what's different now is I don't change hands. I depress the plunger with my non-dominant hand. Once it's done, I move that hand out of the way. Don't put it back, just keep it away when I pull out at the same angle. So I hold the syringe. I never transfer the syringe from my dominant to my non-dominant. So that's why some people do prefer this. The trick is, is to get that in the right position to begin with, right? I can't have it like this. I've got to go from here to here, okay? From here to here, line it up. So that when I go to inject over here, one inch away, see the bend in my wrist, see the hand there, it's still straight, 90 degrees, one inch away, I'm gonna go all the way in. 
My palm is resting here, so my non-dominant injects and away, come out at the same angle, okay? Try and practice either of those, okay? I cannot tell you which one you're gonna like better until you do with the cap needle, obviously do some dry runs, try it either way, okay? So I'll try the first way one last time and then I'm gonna go on from there, okay? So go back to the first one, roll the palm down, spread the skin, nice and comfortable, no weird hand position, one inch away, smooth motion all the way in, slide and hold, inject with my dominant, switch back and hold it with my dominant as I pull it away, pull it back. And now let's look at the needle thing, this grasshopper leg. It's real important. Once you come out of the patient's arm, remember this is a dirty needle. So you're going to point it down between your legs, right over the sharps container, and then you're gonna activate it, okay? The way you activate it is, again, the idea of a shaking engineer sharp is you shouldn't come anywhere up near the needle. So from the top here, just use your finger on that switch and you're gonna slide it down. All right, the reason I say you gotta be pointing down when they do this, one year, and this has been five years ago from now, in this class, somebody pulled out of their patient, pointed it up and went to flick it. And instead of flicking it, hadn't screwed the needle on tight enough. And the whole needle came off, did a 180 and sank right into their leg. Okay, and we had to do the whole emergency protocol, well, with the bloodborne pathogens and go to Lawrence Memorial and do all that testing. That was a hassle. Let's avoid that. All you have to do when you come out, point in which direction? Down between your legs. And again, I'll go ahead and activate it now. So I'm just going to take this thing here. Just slide it and you'll see that it covers up the needle and then going straight down because the sharp says between your legs, you're gonna just come down here, drop the whole syringe into the sharps container, okay? Once that's done, then we are very concerned about our patient. We get the cotton ball. We put the pressure on there for about five seconds, wipe up any blood or kind of rub it. Don't coax it, but kind of put pressure and then wipe any blood. I gave you the nice jumbo cotton balls. So it should be able to suck up any blood, no problem. Once it's done, even if you don't see any blood, it's a potential biohazard, where does it go? Sharps container, so put that in the sharps container as well. And then lastly, your Band-Aid that was up and ready to go, you're ready to put the Band-Aid on, okay? And I'll spare you doing that. All right, so there you have it. This is my demonstration and discussion about the IM. So let me start, share the screen one more time and go through sub-Q and then we're gonna come out and we can all practice. So share screen. All right, so there we have it. Oh, I gotta hit the button again. So uh, a couple of things about the IM injections, some kind of an idea, is we are gonna talk about, before you do this injections, you're gonna to wanna to position yourself and your partner. Remember how we talked about your partner needs to be sitting back in this chair, straight back, legs uncrossed, feet on, hopefully on the floor, raise their chair up, lower your chair down, so you are eye level with their, uh, eye level with their injection site, not with their eyes, okay? Remember, you're gonna have your cotton ball and Band-Aid there in case they do bleed, okay? Things to avoid on your partner would be uh, any scars, moles, or tattoos potentially. So again, if they got a big old tattoo and it says mom and you can go through the O, fine. If they've got tattoos on one arm, inject them in the other arm. If they're covered up everywhere and there's nowhere within a normal deltoid for you to inject, you can go through the uh, a tattoo if you have to, but it's best to try to avoid it. Okay, so I keep forgetting, I get let's see here. It's just weird with the video. Let me change this thing here. All right, so. Anyways, what I was getting at here is the last thing that does happen sometimes is injecting, you're injecting, and all of a sudden as you're pushing the needle in, it just stops. I mean, it stopped. You didn't stop, it stopped. Should you continue to really shove at it? No, what happens if you're going in and boom, it stops, you won't hear anything, you'll feel it though, is you can hit the bone. If the needle is too long and you've gone past the muscle and hit the bone, here's the deal. The patient won't feel it. There are no nerve endings in the bone. So if you hit it, then just stop and the, you know who's gonna feel it? You're gonna feel it all over your body. There's just a tingling that goes everywhere, right? Cause you realize, oh, I just hit the bone. So if you don't go ah, ee, or make a weird noise, they'll never know. So just stay calm, pull back a little bit so that you're back into the muscle, not against the bone, finish the injection and pull out. The best way to avoid that is by carefully looking at your patient and making sure you have the right needle to begin with. Remember, if you've really got a thin, no muscle person, then you switch down to a 5 8 inch needle. That would help minimize that mistake. But if it happens, stay cool, just back up a little bit, finish the injection and pull out, okay? So those are the main things with the IM. Let's talk about sub-Q and I'll try to do this quickly. Sub-Q, location is a little bit different. I think so in terms of where you're gonna inject in somebody's arm, you tend to try to do it on, you know, this is not gonna work. I'll try to uh, see if I can, oh, this is so bad. 
Oh, let's see. I'll try to show you how my guy here. That's got to be better. I'm just going to leave this on. Okay, so the location on this guy here would be, here's the deal, right? So sub Q, we don't want to be over where the deltoid is. We want to be below the deltoid. Below the deltoid is the tricep. Again, if you do it right over the tricep, there's not much fat. So it helps to kind of visualize the tricep. And I can show you when we go out there, you can have the instructor show you how to visualize the tricep, but don't do it right over the tricep. So we want to be below the tricep. So I would say in this person going again, deltoid here, tricep here. So from here down to the elbow, so about here down to the elbow, we also don't want to go towards the back. If you're at the very back of this person, it's going to hurt more. So we tend to make a triangle between below the tricep, down to the elbow and towards the back here. So going forward, back, right and around this area, again, is where you would pinch and elevate the skin. It'd be right around here. So on him to right there. So I'm kind of trying to show you, there's midline. So we don't want to be in the midline. We're going to be slightly posterior towards the back, not all the way back here, but slightly posterior. And again, you think about mid arm below the tricep and above the elbow, about right around here is where you would inject. Okay, and I know it's kind of hard to see on this guy, so I'll move on but that's where we'll help, help you find that location. So where you're going to inject is a little bit different. I'm just gonna stick with my video here. Okay, how to hold the syringe is also very different, okay? So this is really important. Everyone grab your syringe that you prepared, your sub Q syringe, don't take the cap off, leave it cap, but let's practice how to do this. So hold it in your non-dominant hand. This is kind of the trick part, hold it in your non-dominant hand. Take your dominant hand that you're gonna to wanna to inject with and take like this and salam and go palm up. Palm up with your finger and thumb facing away from you. So palm up, fingers facing away. You're gonna take your non-dominant hand and you're gonna lower it down. You're gonna reach up and grab it with your thumb and index finger. So see my thumb and index finger? I'm gonna come down, reach up and grab it with my thumb and index finger, all right? And in this case, you want the grasshopper leg facing up towards you, okay? So grasshopper leg facing up, fingers salam, Da, 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 down, grab it with your thumb and index finger and hold it like that. You look like a big okay because you're holding it out between your thumb and your index finger and you've got these fingers here. And these fingers are gonna do an important job. You'll see here in a minute. These need to be able to extend to stabilize and your thumb and your index finger need to waggle a little bit to get the right angle. So once you've got it where you want it, you won't move it. But remember, but holding it like this, hand down, lower it to your thumb and your index finger. And then the dexterity you need are these three fingers need to be able to curl out to do it. And again, you're gonna maybe need to adjust the angle between your thumb. So again, you don't wanna hold it down here at the base. You don't wanna hold it way up here. So just a little bit closer to the front, hold it, grasshopper leg up, and there you have it, okay? So that's what's really different about how to hold it, all right? So the other thing, I'll just show you on my guy here. Let's just practice on my guy. Here's the deal. Now, unfortunately, so let's go through the whole system here. So I'm, let me cite. So I need the alcohol swab. So I'm gonna, okay, there's the tricep, angle going like this, angle going down to the elbow so we don't get too close to the elbow. We don't wanna come down here. So we've got a little thing going like this here, there's the back. So I'm gonna inject them right here. So right here towards the back. So take my alcohol swab, same thing we did before, right over the spot, little circle, bigger circle, bigger circle and stop. All right, while that's drying, what do I need for after the injection? It's the same as before. Where's my cotton ball? Boom, there's my cotton ball, cotton ball. Where am I on the screen? There it is, cotton ball. <laughs> okay, cotton ball there, Band-Aid. You're gonna need a Band-Aid for afterwards. So there's my Band-Aid afterwards. And then my sharps container on the feet, on the floor, it's the same place we said before. So it's where I need it to be. In that amount of time, it's ready to go. All right, I'm going to take my syringe. Here's my dominant hand. Hand up, palm away, drop it down, grab it with my thumb and index finger. It's ready to go. Take the cap, what's the word? Space, remove it that way, set it aside, and I'm ready to inject, all right? So what I'm gonna show you here, holding it like I'm supposed to be, remember between my thumb and finger and my things, I'm just gonna just show you, I'm not gonna do the injection. Now, unfortunately, my guy here, this is where I'm gonna inject, right? But unfortunately, he doesn't have any padding here. So I'm gonna do everything else up here, but I'm really down here. Sorry for that, but he's not padded down here. So I'm gonna inject in here, all right? So remember, the big differences are with your non-dominant hand, you're going to pinch and elevate. You're not gonna make it tight. You're gonna pinch and lift up. So that's pinching and lifting. 
and you're going to inject at the base of your pinch. So not up here by your fingers, you're going to in inject at the base right where you're starting to lift up from the, the arm. So you're going to pinch and elevate. That's where you're going to side. You're going to take this. And again, the injection here is not 90 degrees. So this would be 90 degrees. Okay. This is too far. This is 45 degrees. You want to inject at a 45 degree angle. So if you think about this being 90, that's about 45. We don't want to be like this. That's too far. So 45 right around there, okay? So you pinch and elevate. You're gonna come, I'll hold it right here in a minute, but one inch away at the 45 degree angle, okay? So now what I need to do, so you guys can see, is hold it like we talked about, okay? This hand is gonna pinch and elevate, and then one inch away, 45 degrees, inject. Now just look at my hand, okay? So the trick here is these two fingers, your thumb and index finger, do you see where it can adjust the angle? So their job, not after you've injected it. So this is before you inject it, but I'm just trying to show you. You wanna make sure your thumb and index finger can hold it at the 45 degree angle. And you see these fingers here, they've got an important job. If they were over here, they wouldn't be able to do anything. So you've got to turn your wrist so that these fingers can extend. And you see where I'm using my fingers, I'm pressing against the arm, holding that at a 45 degree angle. Now watch, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna lock my hand in position, pull that needle out. And this is the position it needs to be in before I even inject. So this is what I'm saying. It takes a little bit of practice to learn how to kind of have these fingers and these things in the right way so that when I do pinch and elevate, okay, that I do get about the hand in the right position to begin with, inject, and then move my fingers as needed so that absolutely in the right position before I release the pinch. But once it's right, I release the pinch with my non-dominant hand. Your dominant hand is gonna stay there the entire time. It does not move, okay? It's your non-dominant hand that's gonna come around here then and do the injection, kind of like we said before. So you just depress the plunger, okay? Hand away, don't put it back, keep it out of the way. And then you're gonna come out at the same angle. So if you went in at 45, you have to come out at 45, all right? So let me show you that at a little bit more kind of speed. So, okay, hand like this. Drop it down, grab it between my thumb and index fingers, extend these fingers, kind of get it at the right angle to begin with, okay? So the hand's in that position. Pinch and elevate the skin, one inch away, about 45 degree angle, inject in, hold it steady. Look at my hand positioning, it's holding it steady. As I then inject, so you can see, hand away. Now I'm gonna do something wrong. See if you can see what I do wrong. Did you hear something? Was there a click? It clicked because I went in at 45, but I came out at a 90 degree angle. So remember when you're done here, hand away, come out at the same angle you injected so it doesn't flick and make that noise and potentially hurt your patient more than is necessary, okay? Once you pull out, very important, point it down, activate the sharp, drop it into the sharps between your leg, well, bam, get your cotton ball right over the spot, give it five seconds, wipe it, put it into the sharps container, get your Band-Aid, put it on, okay? Well, that, ooh, it's stuck. <laughs> yeah, all right, let's see here. Uh, do I, I'm going to now share the screen and see if there's anything else or we're going to be ready to do it here. So these were some of the things I skipped through here. There's the angle, 45, pinch the skin, hold it correctly, 45. There we have it. Last thing I guess I got to say is you've got this form filled out. It is important though here in a minute that you're now what you're gonna do is decide which one of you is gonna be the pharmacist first and do the injections, okay? So what you're gonna to wanna to do is trade needles. So make sure the syringes and needles you prepared, you're gonna to hand to your partner and they're gonna hand theirs to you. So you should be practicing and injecting them with the syringes and needles they prepared. Keep the caps on and the way that I think we're gonna do this is to have the whoever pharmacist do dry runs, practice both IM and sub Q. When you and ask the instructors for help, well, they're to help you get used to how to hold it and what you're supposed to do. When you're ready, call an instructor over, be patient otherwise. If you're waiting for us and you're not practicing on each other, please stay on opposite side of the benches so you minimize the amount of time you're less than six feet from each other. But put on the face shields for both of you as you're close enough to be able to be practicing on each other. Okay, when you're doing that and then bring the instructor over, we'll watch you, we'll have you do a dry run, meaning with a capped needle for the IM first, we'll watch you, give you some technique or any tips, then we'll say, great, just do it. So at that point, you're going to take the cap off or you'll swab them down and do the injection. We will give you immediate feedback on your first injection, that'll give you a chance to practice your second injection, so you will go straight into your second IM shot, and after that, we will do then have you do your sub-Q. 
When you're done with all three of those, then we will leave you and go to a different group and do that over there. When we finish with that person, we'll come back around. And then by that time, make sure that the, the you've switched roles and whoever wasn't the pharmacist has had chance to practice while we were gone, okay? With that, when we're all said and done, you need to make sure that the instructor signs off on that sheet of paper and collects it from you. Any extra trash can be just put back into that plastic bag and thrown away. Remember, all the needles would have been put into the sharps container. Also in front of you are some EpiPen demos and AviQ, another auto epinephrine auto injector. So when we're done, we're gonna ask you to kind of quickly show us how to demonstrate the use of the proper use of the EpiPens. Once you've done all of that, you give us the sheet, clean up your stuff, throw that away, keep your face shield, make sure you keep it for next semester and you'll be good to go. All right, so with that, go start practicing with each other. I'll be coming out and make sure you ask instructors and make sure you're watched before you do it. <laughs>